their reaction. And they, they will have a, a huge, they'll have a huge amount of support. You can guarantee it from, uh, from this family here and this family across the nation. One final question from the Langley Research Center. Uh, Chris Dovey with the Richmond Times Dispatch. Um, how many tiles in a given area of uh, surface, specifically the area where the sensors were located, uh, could be lost before that might cause some catastrophic breach um, of that surface? And what do you do in, in flight if you have that catastrophic breach and you know about it prior to reentry? I, I really don't know how many tiles. I can't re really respond to that question here today. Uh, and I mentioned earlier to you that um, we have no capability to repair a tile. Uh, our only recourse is to design this vehicle such that we don't lose tiles, is to design this vehicle so that we can take debris impacts and not represent a safety concern. It's been our experience that we have lost portions of tiles on the bottom of the vehicle. We have had a number of uh, debris impacts, damage to the tiles. They have all um, been acceptable in that they do not represent a safety of flight concern. We would like to get uh, a harder tile to make, make it more resilient to debris, but it has not to date represented a safety concern. Um, and we have no recourse if we lose tiles. Our only effective action is to prevent the loss of tiles through design and through test, and that has been perfectly adequate up to this point. Okay, that's the final question for this briefing, and let me end and close on a couple of programming notes for folks uh, watching. Uh, there will be a B-roll package for the STS-107 mission that will follow uh, this briefing immediately. Uh, the next briefing that we will hold is likely to be around noon central time tomorrow, but uh, that's a very tentative time uh, because there are some, um, obviously some management meetings that these gentlemen are, are taking part in uh, that will occur prior to that tomorrow. So uh, right now we're looking at around noon central tomorrow for the next briefing here. Um, also, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, folks out there that, are, that may be uh, discovering some de debris from the accident. NASA has established a uh, telephone hotline, also an electronic mail address for the public to use for reporting information that may help in the investigation uh, of this accident. Uh, the telephone line, and, it, and you guys can certainly help us in this regard, is uh, 281-483-3388. Uh, the website uh, that right now uh, should be online for uh, folks to provide either text reports or images that they think may be helpful in the investigation for us. Uh, that website address is NASA MIT Images altogether, N A S A M I T Images at JSC for Johnson Space Center at jsc.nasa.gov. Um, so, uh, and we will try to build a uh, billboard or something like that that we could put on NASA TV as well to help folks with that. So again, the phone number is 281-483-3388, and that is for the uh, NASA hotline that has been established. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, very much, and uh, we will see you guys tomorrow.
been listening to a lot of uh, technicalities, as we heard from uh, Ron Didamore and Milt Heflin, a pair of engineers who work inside the intricacies of the uh, space shuttle program, but also a fair dose of emotion as they deal with what is truly a loss to the NASA family. And uh, we send our condolences here at CNN to all of those at NASA directly affected by this. I'd like to read you a quote from Gus Grissom, who died July 20, excuse me, January 27th, 1967, the Apollo 1 fire on launch pad at the Kennedy Space Center. If we die, we want people to accept it. We're in a risky business, and we hope that if anything happens to us, it will not delay the program. The conquest of space is worth the risk of life. Gus Grissom, prophetic words, NASA, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo astronaut. We spoke to everybody on this crew before they left, and we asked them a lot of questions about their joy of their job and the risks they take, and whether they accept those risks willingly to a person. They said yes. Let's listen to them. We do have a lot of first-time flyers. Four out of the seven are first-time flyers. Three of the others out of the seven have only flown once. So combined amongst the seven, we have three flights. And we joke amongst ourselves that Jerry Ross, who just flew uh, recently, has by himself seven flights. So he's got us beat by, by a factor of two. And we're hoping that when we come back from a mission, we'll be beating him combined. You know, we'll have 10 flights amongst all of us, and so we'll jump ahead of Jerry. <laughs> I think every space mission is, is uh, special and everyone comes with its own set of uh, challenges and, and uh, exciting things to do and uh, I couldn't be any more excited about a space mission than I am about this one. But once this flight is over I'll be back in line for the next flight and whether it's a Hubble flight or going to the International Space Station I'm sure it's going to be another exciting uh, space mission just like this one. I look forward to it. To me, uh, I guess because I'm the flight engineer and my background is in aircraft systems. And that is something I have loved since I was 14, 15, you know, the engineering track and really wanting to know the nuts and bolts, how a system works, if this happens, what's going on. And uh, then on some of these more intense periods of our orbit, the ascent, uh, when we do the on-orbit maneuvering system burn to uh, basically get to the orbit that we need to and then the deorbit burn we do to come back home and the entry routine and play a role in those is just uh, tremendous I mean I have lived my life for that in some sense. Kalpana Chawla, a naturalized American born in India, a NASA astronaut talking about the thrill of spaceflight and how she lives for the event uh, in which she perished earlier today.